And good evening, afternoon, or good night, depending on where you are today. This is Ryan Ponto from Transatlantic Brews here with Mark Henshaw today over on that side there. How are you doing, Mark? Good, thanks. How are you? Happy New Year. Good. Happy New Year. Yes, this is the first show of the new year. And uh, it's also episode 16. So we've been doing this for a little while. I think we know kind of what we're doing, but what do I know? I just work here. <laughs> That's pretty much it. That's a new year. Just work here. We're a team. <laughs> We're a team. We're a team. We work together here. Team drunken idiots. There you go. Yeah, how many people can actually go up to someone and say, I'm sorry, I can't go out for lunch with you. I am drinking for work. Uh, yeah. You can you can say that. You can I did say that. I said that yesterday actually. Oh, Somebody invited can... me out for the afternoon and I said, No, I can't. I am drinking for work. <laughs> <laughs> I like your style. That's um yeah. That's that's a first, isn't it? Definitely. Isn't it? Did, did, did you enjoy saying it? Did it? Did it, it? Every every molecule of my being just savored every moment of that. Uh, dear. It's a little bit like when we had uh, at my day job, at least, that mm. uh, wine and cheese tasting. It's like, oh no, I've 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 got. It's going to be really hard. I'm going to have to try all these wines and all these artisan cheeses. It's going to be terrible. Uh, just awful. Sounds sounds rough. <laughs> yeah, it was real rough. I I got through it, but you know. Yeah, we'll see. Ah, uh, so, you've got a beer. What have you got? I have got a beer. Yeah. Um. Hopefully, you've got a beer too. I hope. Uh, um, several. <laughs> but just one for the show. Just one for the show. Good, good, good. Uh, I've got an O'Hara's Irish Pale Ale, which is a craft beer from Ireland. Uh, believe it or not, I, I hear that craft brewing is 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 taken off in Ireland now. There's more than just, you know, there's more than just Guinness. To Ireland and um, more than just Guinness to Dublin in particular. Uh, there's a few people. I think in particular the Galway Bay Brewery is doing pretty well in in Ireland. But this is O'Hara's Irish Pale Ale. And it's a dry hopped IPA um, at 5.2 percent. Just briefly bringing up Beer Advocate here. It says it's a contemporary style IPA with an Irish twist, combining the balance of European IPAs with the generous dry hopping dry hopping of American pale ales. Um, this is a beer. This beer is everything an IPA should be and more. It says so. It has a zesty, refreshing bitter. Um, the uh, sorry, zesty and refreshing bitter. The finish is long with a copper tone uh, body and with lightly carbonated head. Dry hopping brings an intense aroma and lasting array of fruit and floral notes. So sounds good. What have you got, Ponte? Uh, I've got from New Zealand, actually, the Excellent. Eight Wire Brewings C4 Double Coffee Brown Ale. Uh, this is a mighty one at 8%. They only serve it in a 500 milliliter bottle, thank God, because I don't yeah. think I could do a six and all this. Yeah. Um, their, their description on their site is actually uh, pretty apt. It says basically, you know, coffee and beer struggle for, you know, the world's greatest drink overall. So yeah. why not combine them? Put them together. Yeah, and a brown ale in there as well, which is uh, yeah. What's that? Interesting that the it's a um, coffee with a brown ale this time rather than um, than just a stout or, or a porter as we're used to seeing. But still, I'm I'm all for combining coffee and uh, and beer as we've seen in the past. Excellent. <laughs> sounds, sounds promising. So you structure the show. I still have to keep reminding myself. We're going to pour the beers and then we're going to get into the news, right? Yes. The news. Very important, the news, serious stuff. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. All right. All right. Crack your so, Let's get cracking. Looking forward to this one, actually. I've never had an Irish craft beer, so this will be a first for me, at least. Interesting cap, actually. Just, I like the copper colour to it. Oh, yeah. that's pretty interesting. Mm. Mine's nothing too spectacular. It's kind of like a wire drawing of their, their logo. Mm. I've heard really it, good things about that. Yeah, that? It looks cool. I've, I've heard really good things about that brewery, by the way. So, mm. Mm. Yeah, it's the first time I've seen it over here. I saw it just in the liquor store the other day. So, yeah, weird. Why not? Go for it. Push the boat out. The boat. Yeah, push the boat out. It's the same <laughs> over here, I suppose. Perhaps not. Over oh, there. So we've got the same same glasses today as well. Oh, we have. Yes. We have. I suppose it being a IPA, I should have it in the IPA glass, but. I I don't know. I always, I always feel drawn to these kind of glasses somehow. Um, even though I, the IPA glass is great, but I do like a stemmed glass. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So, whilst we let that uh, 
mull over for a little bit, shall I bring up a news article? Yeah, what do you got? So over in the UK, um, sort of slow news week, I suppose. Uh, I've got an awful lot for you um, directly, but I just quickly d- dug this up before the show. So um, Manchester's first citywide beer festival is to launch in 2016. So I guess similar to Craft Beer Week in, in Vancouver and various other cities around the world, Manchester is to see its first ever citywide beer festival to be launched next summer, transforming the region into a 10-day celebration of the nation's favorite favorite drink it says uh, manchester's beer week will run from june the 10th till june the 19th but unlike most beer festivals it will not be tied to a single venue so essentially they've already got 40 venues uh, and almost 30 breweries signed up for the festival which will run across the greater manchester area so um yeah pretty pretty cool so if you're in the manchester area sounds like a, a must must a must visit it sounds like the uh, vancouver craft uh, craft beer week yeah, it does, doesn't it? We yeah. have in, uh, in in October. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's lots of stuff that happens there. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. But it's, like, all across. Like, all the different theaters have things that they host, and all these different venues have tasting mm-hmm. sites. It's crazy. So it's it like a step in the right direction. Is What's it that? May that they run? Have I got that right? Is it May that they run the Vancouver one? Uh, no, the, the last one they did was, uh, it was Vancouver Craft Beer Week. So it was, it was a week in October there. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. Got you. There Sounds may be good. another one coming up in May. I'm, I haven't checked the schedule yet, but uh, they do one every now and then. I've probably just got my wires crossed, but uh, yeah, definitely something you should you should get down to. Yeah. Um, well, la- last year, uh, if you recall, or, or this past past one, I went yeah. to that thing called uh, Beer Lesk, which was the uh, craft oh, beer yeah. festival and a burlesque show in one. Of course. Yeah. So you get these little three or four uh, ounce glasses and they go around to all the different breweries. They'll have one of those, have one of those, have one of those. And by the time you're done, you've yeah. probably had about six or seven pints worth of beer. You <laughs> know, over the course of four or five hours. Yeah. It's the way to do it. There's, there's no point really drinking pints at a beer festival unless you only want to try a handful of beers, right? Yeah. You may as well have, may as well have samples, I suppose. Exactly. Something else fun in the news yeah. here. Um, you know the the, the Star Wars uh, movie that's come out recently. Yeah. Well, Wits End Brewing actually made a series of five different beer that uh, were named after the after the you know the Star Wars franchise they released right when the movie came out. Uh, there it is. The list of them are as follows: Darth Malt, Darth Luke, Malt. I am your Pater. <laughs> uh, that's a pet Pater's beer. Yeah. Uh, Imperial Rye Fighter. Right. Old Jedi Mind Trick. And yeah. My the Fourth Awakens. Sounds fun. Yeah. All all yeah. different styles. They have things, you know, old older German styles, Belgian styles, American styles as well. Um, seems uh, seems quite quite fun and festive for the for the occasion. Who's the brewer? Do it. What's that? Who's the brewer? Uh Wits End. Ah, right. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Nice little. Pure cool Star Wars really. fan. What's yeah, that? you're a Star Wars fan, aren't you? I am. I've I've seen it uh, twice now, actually. Yeah. The, the new one, once in 3D, once in regular. I'm not. Um, I've never really followed it, to be honest with you. I guess it's just never really caught my appeal or my um, attention. But I I know you've uh, you're a fan. And having seen it twice now in two different uh, versions. Well, what one time was because a friend from out of town wanted to go. The second time, the friend who wanted to go, no, none of the other friends that we had at the time would, were willing to go. So I was like, "What the hell? Why not? Yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah, that was a good Some time." Bear repeating, don't they? So what's that? So certain movies bear repeating, mm. don't they? Yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, so what else is in uh, news in North America land? North America land. Well, there was a. Bit of a more serious thing that happened in, in Ontario here. I'll send you a link to the to the article. Uh, anyone wants to read it. Basically, it seems in in Ontario there's two there's two larger sort of powers at be that are the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, which has its own stores, and yeah. there's Beer Store, which is a local chain to Ontario. And they recently found out they had an agreement since 2000 that favored. Uh, beer store in a lot of things and it, it just seemed really odd some of the conditions on it uh, which basically seemed to eliminate the liquor control board as a competitor mm. more or less in certain areas 
So if if the beer store had this is one of them, if the beer store hadn't had a store in the area, and a liquor control board store came in as well, the liquor control board couldn't carry anything larger than a six pack of anything the beer store carries. All right. Oddly specific. Yeah. Uh, and also any anyone who buys, you know, as a licensee, like a restaurant or a pub or, or whatever, if the beer store carried what they were ordering, they couldn't mm. buy it from the control board. They had to go to the beer store to get it. All right. It's very strange stuff like that. And this has been happening since yeah. uh, since 2000. They have this whole thing. And, um, you know, it, it, I wonder if it's a way to help control pricing and all that as well. Mm. Um, but I believe that's technically illegal to basically have a monopoly or uh, pretty much at this point or an oligopoly as it really is with the two of them. And then yeah. you determine this is the price and this is how business will be for this industry. So it's almost it, like an illegal agreement. It doesn't sound great for competition. Um, but as we know, with most of the, the liquor controls in, um, in Canada generally, a lot of it is state controlled. Uh, so it seems odd, though, that, I mean, are, are, they, are this beer store um, state-owned as well? or No, it's that's private. Private, yeah, okay. Privately owned, and it's well, that's the changed it very often. Yeah, that's the thing that makes it weird, but it definitely doesn't sound, I don't fully get it. It sounds odd. I don't, you know, I'd have to dig a little bit deeper and better understand how things work generally with the, with the laws with this kind of thing in that part of the world. But it doesn't sound very good for competition, is all I would say is my thoughts on it. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the less of something there is, the more it's going to cost. So that's just basic, basic economics. So, you know, it doesn't sound very good for consumer choice and price. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Part of the world. You've got so, the two people to go to that are, yeah, you know, one's government and one's independent. Yeah. However, they're in an agreement that's basically controlling how things go. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, doesn't sound great, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about you. I, for, for for the sake of craft beer lovers, um, you can't, for, particularly if you can't get to a brew pub in in Canada. I, I'd like to see more less state control in in Canada with that kind of stuff and more general competition, so that people could sell direct more, um, and there'd be less of this control as to what gets in the country as well. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, different from province to province as well, which makes it even more complicated. A bit like America in that way, I suppose. You know, province to province. I mean, Britain it's relatively simple. It's just one law across the entire land, pretty much. Um, some variances in in some of the areas within Great Britain, as opposed to England. So Scotland having slightly different. Um, I know they have a lower drink drive limit, for example, and they have different taxation on alcohol, I believe, different tax levels, um, as will probably Wales as well or Northern Ireland. Uh, but generally speaking, things are roughly the same. Mm-hmm. Not the same extreme differences that you get um, from different states in America uh, or even some of the differences that you get in Canada. So um, generally yeah. for consumer choice, that's that's good in the UK. Uh, and as we've covered several times before, it's that three-tier system in the U.S. that I think really holds a lot of that back. And um, yeah, I don't know. This is this is just Canada's version of that kind of quirk and that kind of control, I suppose. Now here's another another odd sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Craft beer has been growing steadily, growing steadily in Ontario, yeah. where they have a more government-controlled sort of system mm. versus. Quebec, which is a very open market in that regard. They don't care who sells and who's a distributor or makes a craft or whatever. I didn't but know that. Yeah. I'm stagnant in, in their numbers. Yeah. So it's very it's very funny to see that we have we have this one deal in Ontario there, and it's it's a bit odd. Might be illegal, might not be. Um, that's kind of controlling everything for distribution. But you're mm. seeing more people that are are getting into craft brewing and they're creating these breweries and doing quite well, apparently right. back where it's all open fields. Mm. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, actually I'll get to later on in this series. I was going to cover this, um, this book, just whack myself in the face with the book. Um, <laughs> just not but, on camera, no problem. Yeah. Um, the only 
Canadian city that is mentioned is is Montreal, actually, um, where it talks about most of the influences from sort of French and Belgian styles of beer. But there are some there is some craft brewing going on there as well. But it sounds like there's there's quite a good beer culture having sort of grown there. Um, but you but you say you reckon it's not growing at the same rate as Ontario at the moment. There there was a, a study done and and um, you know for numbers and sales and all that sort of stuff. You know what analysts like to do with that stuff. Yeah, and they're saying basically that the the numbers in Quebec are growing, but very, very slowly to the point where it's almost flat growth, right? right. Less than 1%. Yeah. Whereas in Ontario, it's it's exponentially growing or growing mm-hmm. at such a you know large rate comparatively that it, it seems almost crazy that why isn't Quebec doing anything, mm. you know, anywhere near it or even half of it. So maybe it's, it's a friend. very interesting thing that to, to think about that we've got this this weird deal in Ontario. <laughs> so and maybe Quebec's all over the deal. what's that? I said maybe it's because they're French. I don't know. Well, they think they are. I don't know. <laughs> well, no offense to any no, of our um, no no, know, no comment here. Yeah, no offense to any of our Quebec uh, viewers. We love all of our viewers. I did um, live in Quebec for a while. It was quite lovely once the snow uh, yeah, snow I'm, went I'm, away. I've been to Montreal and I've been to the part, particularly the old part of Montreal. It's it's lovely, um, and it's quite interesting to see that things have clearly moved on quite a lot from when I was last there because I don't remember. Uh, I mean, admittedly, I didn't get very long to have a look around, but um, it does look like there's a, a lot of brew pubs um, in Montreal, and that that sounds you know sounds promising and great. But yeah, in- interesting. I don't know. Maybe that's just consumer appetite. Well, I, I'm wondering if it has something to do with since there's such a rigid structure already in, in Ontario the way it is, it's predictable, so people can make business plans around it more easily. Uh, Whereas right. in Quebec, it might take a little more effort to actually get something moving. Ah, uh, so it's a there's, business. No, there's no central body for it. More about business um, laws rather than um, alcohol control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like that. Or yeah. I mean, the the higher taxes in, in Quebec may have something to do with it. Maybe they have more taxes on the liquor than any place in the country because they already have a 13% tax, which is tax on top of tax. Yeah. So might have something to do with that too. I'm not quite sure, but yeah, so, so, something to look into. Um, but yeah, it does seem like, cause I, I remember you, you obviously difficult to buy beer from a supermarket back then um, in, in British Columbia, but I do remember going to Montreal and, and, and you could buy beer at just like a gas station, you know? So obviously the distribution's much more, slack there um but yeah in, in, interesting something to something to look into i, su- I suppose but, mm-hmm. uh, yeah cool interesting is that is that it for news or are we um uh well i've got some time a little about an app but uh you go on with your with the book i think that's probably gonna catch people's attention a little more i'll get to the book soon because i've only got a small beer and i'll run out if we don't start soon so let's let's get to the beers and then i'll get into the book later on how's your um how's your beer it's uh, it's it's relatively sweet actually. It's uh, lots of that caramelly sort of vanilla sort of smell to it. Yeah. Coffee is a little. There's like it's very minute actually. You know, given the title, I thought it'd be a lot more um, a lot more coffee punch to it, bitterness. Yeah. But um, overall, I think it's I think it's a pretty well balanced drink. It's um, mm. the sweetness and and the bitterness of of the coffee that's obviously in there and the taste anyway. Kind of balances that that sweet and bitterness out there, and yeah. uh, it's quite smooth. It doesn't stay too long in the mouth, but you get this sort of lasting, um, sort of like roasted. You know, coffee smells. That's yeah. what it tastes. But it smells. It's kind of like that on your tongue. Ah, so more. I don't know. Depending on the coffee, of course. But, mm. So we're talking what sort of chocolate or slightly nutty? Um, uh, sort sort of like a, uh, a just roast. like a sweetie roasty sort of sort of yeah. flavor there, right? That's yeah. um, it's has no bitterness to it, but it's it's not overpowering. It's a quite a pleasant little uh, yeah coffee taste. See, I really like stouts that have that dry bitterness that you get, and it's different from hot bitterness. So you get um, instead of the sort of yeah, that citrusy sort of slightly acidic burst or whatever the bitterness from hops. You get this lovely dry bitterness, and that comes from the the roasted barley as opposed to the roasted malt um, elements of it, or very heavily roasted malts. But in particular, roasted barley gives off a lot of that 
So it's unmalted roasted barley, gives off a lot of that very, very lovely dry bitterness. Um, and I really like that in stouts. And I don't know, maybe maybe, maybe there's an element of that in there, but it's, but it's a brown ale, not a stout. So um, it's, quite, it's yeah. quite a bit lighter in, in, in texture and, uh, and the bitterness is, is not quite the same, of course. No. It's quite a bit on the more sweeter malty side than it is on the, the roasty yeah. side, yeah. I almost forgot to say it's a brown ale there for a second. For some reason, I just I just keep thinking coffee and stout because that's what you see most of the time. So well, it's still very just, common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just I've never actually had a um, a brown ale infused with coffee. So, well, it's quite good. It's just you try it if uh, yeah. it's available there. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. How's yours doing? Yeah, it's it's good. Um, so it's got this lovely floral kind of aroma i mean it's dry hopped so it's got quite a, a lovely bouquet of hops generally as you would expect from something that was dry hopped mm. almost a slight um herbal kind of crushed foliage maybe a slight tea kind of element to it definitely some citrus in there that you'd expect from new world hops probably something like cascade or one of this one of the sea hop uh, varieties from north america Mm, yeah, it's good. It's got a lovely, um, lovely bouquet. I could smell that for quite a long time. It's like orange peel in there as well. Mm. Um, much more balanced on the body. I mean, it does describe that this is a bit of a blend between um, European style IPAs or let's say British style IPAs uh, infused with the American hot character and then sort of dry hops so yeah as, as a body it doesn't have that big boom of say something like a west coast ipa where it really hits you in the face um mm. it is much more balanced there's some lovely sweetness mm. sort of slightly um slightly bready kind of element that kind of comes through um the hops are pretty prominent though generally throughout that sort of citrusy slightly grapefruit there's a fair amount of bitterness but it's it's not um it's not overwhelming nice general very well balanced chewy slightly malty character followed by the lovely fresh hops um lingering bitterness nice and zesty it's a well balanced i don't know whether i would say it was ipa big um feels more like a pale ale to me at this moment um but there you go yeah it's just a lovely very well balanced pretty well made beer i'd have said um yeah lovely particularly the aroma very very nice dry hopped aroma so oh, good my, my first craft beer from from ireland i guess so yeah lovely. that's a very interesting statement all in itself yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure whether it says what part of Ireland this is from. If I can just quickly take a look on the bottle. Really should look these things up more before we start the show, but life kind of gets in the way, shall we say. <laughs> um, but it's the Carlo Brewing Company, apparently, in Ireland. So let's just take a quick look. County Carlo, Ireland. So there you go. There's enough. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. Shall I move on to this? Um, move on to this book. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh dear. So yeah, um, a book that I've just recently gone through, pretty much from cover to cover over the last few days. Uh, a Christmas gift, if you like. So, a book by Mark Dredge called "The Best Beer in the World," and essentially he goes through. Um, he essentially he starts in London and then goes around the world all of these really great beer experiences so he lives like a monk in Orval for example the Trappist um, monastery in Belgium he investigates um, if Guinness really does taste better in Ireland tries to kind of put that myth um, to bed if you like um, travels to Pilsen to drink unfiltered Pilsner Urquell from the brewery tanks which was obviously the, one of the first real pale malt um, lagers or Pilsners the original as it calls itself um, he reveals his admiration for Budweiser, slightly bizarrely, but does talk about a lot of the things that they brought to the brewing world generally, you know, over the years, like things like using past 
pasteurization for the first time uh, and also building uh, railways to transport beer on, on ice trains, for example, all these sort of innovative things that he did for the first time, which deserves credit. And then some of the consistency as well, that they've managed to make it taste exactly the same no matter where it's brewed in the world. So despite the fact it's not particularly exciting beer, um, it's at least you know consistent and there's some credit due there. Um, it goes IPA hunting all down the West Coast, all the way up from San Diego right up to Portland and um, uh, yeah, just all the, the sort of West Coast IPA stuff and then talks about all the different variations of regions of IPAs. Uh, discusses the importance of pioneers like Sierra Nevada. So the first guy to essentially, the guy at Sierra Nevada was, Essentially, he was the first guy to take a, a British style like pale ale and throw American hops at it. He was one of those first people to use uh, the sea hops, like Cascade in particular was the first one. Uh, and being the first one to do that, beer had never really tasted like that before. And it was really the beer that pushed the craft beer revolution forward in the 1980s. So it's an incredibly important beer historically that still stands up today. He covers that. Um, he discusses the importance of um, uh, some of the, not the importance, rather, he moves on to like, asia and australia and things like that as well and it's just a really great read with some really good stories in there i've only covered just a slight summary of some of the stuff that he does but it really does go into some really great detail with some great stories and experiences along the way so uh, if you you're into beer and you, you you know you're curious as to some of the the most the best most unique beer experiences you can have anywhere on in the world and you're into travel um and even if you're into you know eating and drinking and traveling at the same time and all that kind of stuff it's it's really worth a read i would recommend it highly um so yeah i mean it's just a really good read i just thought i'd, I'd highlight it i suppose as something that i've been through over the last um couple of weeks really so yeah so yeah there you go um i'll drop a, a link in the uh in the thingies here and uh yeah and then we that's that's pretty much all i have to say about that as you know um Forrest Gump would say. <laughs> Forrest Gump. Yeah. I have not heard a reference to Forrest Gump in many years. Yeah. That's um, a classic movie. I ran out of ideas, basically. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a great. Did a wonderful job in that, that film. That was quite a good film. Yeah. I, I, I guess it was. Oh, but yeah, I mean, good. it's a good read. I just thought I'd highlight that as a good read, really. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, last thing that I had to talk about, there's a, there's a beer craft beer verification app. It's been around for a few years now, apparently it's called oh, yeah. craft check. And cool. I was telling you a little bit about it earlier. It, what it does is you can scan all the barcodes on your beer. You know, just take a scan of that with your, with your camera on your phone. And it'll actually tell you if it's a craft beer yeah. or a, basically a dub of a craft beer from a larger brewery. So very similar to some of the stuff you had from that Green King did in, in Tesco's there, right? Same idea. They'll tell you, no, this is actually from Green King, which is a huge brewery, blah, blah, blah. Um, or this is from this little boutique brewery over in such and such state or province or wherever. And it'll, it'll tell you you're drinking real craft beer. Now, cool. as interesting as that is. I like the sound of that. Yeah. Where's the line between craft beer, between big brewery and little brewery? Well, yeah. doesn't, doesn't really specify in the, in the article here I've read anyway about exactly how they differentiate but from the wording of it it says the big guys so I'm assuming you know the the satellite breweries of you know Sab Miller and, and such they'd kind of classify them all together yeah but that's, that's anyway. interesting so I guess they're just talking about big conglomerates but they, they'd have to permanently update that wouldn't they I mean because things are changing uh, but also they um i suppose they would have to define they'd have to define themselves what they define as craft beer and uh, or, or or an interpretation now if you go by the uh, american association of brewers then it's um small artisan and produced independently and there's a few different things that they list but yeah you essentially you'd have to define what what the benchmark was for that to work and i guess they must have some sort of benchmark but um, from what you were saying there, it's not entirely clear what yeah, that is. Yeah, it just kind of says basically that they'll they'll tell you what you're drinking if it's craft beer or not. Um, yeah, it's a, I like the concept. I really like the concept. I think um, it's really cool. I can't drop the link to this book, by the way, in the comments. I don't see the comment box that's there isn't normally there. If you change my permissions somehow or something. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, oh, that's 
that's weird. Maybe that's a, a bug. Um, on Blab or something. Well, either way, there's there's a link to the uh, to the article for the app there, and it's it's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, for Android now, just recently this this past month here, they uh, they released it for Android. It's on the iOS store as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, it seems like a good app. I'm trying to try it out on my phone, but uh, my phone for some reason doesn't uh, won't accept it. It's not it's not uh, workable with it. But I'll get it on one of my devices yeah. at some point. Well, it's in early early stages, so yeah, see how it uh, goes on. So for people watching retrospectively, what's what's that called? The app because they won't be able to see the it's called the uh, Craft Check. Two words. Craft yeah, Check. Just as it sounds. Yeah. So yeah, go on the go on the app store in your respective device and just search for it. it should be there uh, probably by the time you're watching this. If not, cool. uh, do a, do a quick search for it on uh, on Google and you'll probably come up with it. Nice. Yeah. I like the look of that. Definitely going to download that. I'll give it a go. See if it works on UK ones or whether it's just US ones that are listed at the moment. Um, I'll let yeah, you know. that'd be really interesting to know. I mean, because that, that's a huge database that they, they have to maintain. It'd almost be as big as. Um, yeah. The combined database from you know all the liquor stores from Canada, US, and UK, and all around the world, they would have all of them. You'd have to know all the barcodes, or uh, yeah, I mean, you'd have to have all of those barcodes um, scanned in into a database. I mean, in theory, it's really simple. I mean, you could create an app like that with simply with it using an Excel sheet. <laughs> a big list couldn't you you know you but again you just have to keep maintaining the list mm -hmm. um is is the work behind that i mean and that's going to be every time a new beer is released you'd have to get it in there so i suppose I mean, you could have a team of people across the world doing it but to, i mean to do it across america is one thing but yeah as you were saying to do it globally is another a huge thing. undertaking it almost be a business unto itself yeah yeah <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Does it cost anything? It's free. No, so it's yeah, free, it's all free. It's, it's free on the uh, the iOS app store and it's free on the uh, Google Play store. Yeah. Uh, I thought you said it was free. Yeah. I'm wondering how um, to make money. Yeah. It'd be interesting to, to find that out. There's probably ads on there. Yeah, could but, be. Yeah. But we'll, um, yeah, we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll download it. I'll let you know what, um, what it's like. Sounds good. Well, I think with that, that wraps up this episode. Oh. First yeah. of the new year. Here's to all that in 2016. Yeah. Getting back into it, slightly um, rusty after not doing uh, yes. a show. Yes, we are slightly week. rusty, aren't we? Oh, dear. Yeah, it's we'll um, get back salt. into this with it. All the Sorry? snow and the salt on the streets. Yeah, go on then. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Even that way, it's just too much booze and food. So. <laughs> True enough. Uh, All right. Cheers. We've been Transatlantic Brews. If you're watching this retrospectively, Head over to the website transatlanticbrews.com and get one of your free ebooks. What do we have up there now? We have the Beer Geek Toolkit. Beer Geek Toolkit. Yeah. We also have uh, a need to update, actually. We still have our Christmas ones up there. So, um, hurry yeah, the Beer Geek Toolkit. Monster. What's that? I said hurry before he takes them down because he's a monster. Yeah. Um, they're going. They're going to go. <laughs> Uh, so it's straight on the homepage. If you go to, yeah, if you're transatlanticbrews.com, um, you can get started on your craft beer journey um, with five different ways to improve your craft beer experience. So, yeah. Cheers. Cheers. All the best. See you next week for episode 17, it will be. Cheers.